Um, we have three uh, speakers um, on very um, topical and highly relevant topics, um, developing nuclear systems, ammonia-based combustion systems, and carbon capture and utilization. So I'm going to um, obviously introduce the, the three speakers um, individually just prior to each of their talks. Um, but I, I did just want to say that I, I'm sure that given all of these topics that there's going to be a lot of prescient things said about how to meet the challenges of decarbonizing our technical and also our socio-technical systems in the most efficacious, efficient and ethical ways. So I'm going to on that note, um, move on to introduce our first speaker, who's Dr. Simon Middleborough, who I've just met. Um, and I'm just looking at his biographical notes. He's currently working as a lead researcher at Bang University, um, where they're combining experimental and theoretical techniques to design and understand the behavior of the next generation of nuclear fuels and materials to operate in some of the university's most extreme conditions. Um, he's previously worked in industry and the government on fusion and next generation nuclear systems. So um, he's a reader at the Nuclear Futures Institute, Bangor University, and I'd like to hand over to you now, Simon. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, Aros uh, Pranandao. Let me just share my screen. Um, let's see. There we go. I hope everyone can, can you see that? Excellent, wonderful. So yes, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm gonna give you a quick romp through some of the work we're doing up here uh, in North Wales in the sort of realm of nuclear. Um, and I, before I start, I just wanna say how, um, how much I've really enjoyed today and the wide variety of talks and things like that. I, I've, um, yeah, I've learned a lot and, and, and just a, it's a real pleasure. So thank you very much. Uh, so yes, I'm Simon Middleborough. I'm, up, uh, I'm a reader here at Bagger University. Um, let me move on to the next slide. So I'm going to give a quick outline about me, then I'm going to talk about nuclear power, why nuclear power, and I know it's a contentious issue with some people, so hopefully I can answer a few questions and um, maybe you've got some more questions for me after that. I'll introduce you to the team at Bangor University and what we're doing up here, um, talk to you about some of the capabilities up here in North Wales and what we're planning on doing and why we're doing it. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the research we're doing and we've done in 2021 with a bit of an eye to looking forward to 2022 because it's so close. It's nearly Christmas. I can't believe it. Anyway, a um, little bit on me. Uh, I finished my PhD at Imperial, um, gosh, nearly 10 years ago now. Uh, time flies. I had enough of London. I wanted to get as far away as possible. I managed to get to Australia where I worked at the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization, a place called Anstow. It's a wonderful place if you haven't been or heard of it. It's on the edge of Sydney in a little bit of a rainforest. They've got a little nuclear reactor there um, and they make medical isotopes. And I'll get onto that in a bit because medical isotopes is very important. I got married and I moved back to Europe because there was a bit of a homing beacon to get back. Um, and I worked in Sweden at a company called Westinghouse who make nuclear fuel and um, reactors. Uh, some of which are being or cited, uh, think, thought about being cited in North Wales. And then I started in Bangor in 2018, uh, brought in by my, 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 my boss, uh, Professor Bill Lee, who's the secondary professor in the Nuclear Futures Institute. Um, and yeah, we, we, we started up a lovely team of academics here. So yeah, there's some pictures at the bottom of some nice places I've lived. And I don't have a picture of Bangor, but I'm sure you've all been there and it's a gorgeous place. Not necessarily today in today's weather, but gorgeous. Right. Um, so I've been here just uh, just under four years now, um, and it's been a whirlwind. I've managed to build quite a lovely group of, of, of enthusiastic scientists, technicians and postdocs. Um, we, we're doing really well engaging with industry. And of course, we're, we're sponsored by uh, the Sir Kim Ree programme, which is uh, through the uh, WEFO and Welsh Government. So we've got really lovely links with government there as well. And we're basically we, we, we're flying at the moment. We're, we're, we're growing at a lovely rate and um, we, we, you know, our feet haven't really touched the floor since we started. I just, you know, I can't do this on my own. Um, and it's just a real um, really a big thanks to the team that I'm showing you right here, because, yeah, I couldn't do anything without them. So why nuclear? Um, obviously, when people think nuclear, um, a lot of people think nuclear, not me, um, they these sorts of pictures come to mind. Um, and of course, we've had some 
horrendous experiences with nuclear technology in the past. Um, but these are often uh, overblown um, and um, we don't understand, lots of people don't see the benefits of nuclear. Um, and I just so I, I want to I, I want to acknowledge that that it's a contentious issue. I want to so I think the Simpsons have done awful things for nuclear technology generally, um, but yeah, um, it you know we are it's a it's an extremely um, it's an extremely modern problem, and um, we and 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 you know we 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 split the atom for the first time last 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 century uh, properly, and we 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 developed nuclear power in the 1950s. You know, we're talking about a 60 year old, 70 year old technology really right now, and compared to other things. It, you know, it's really it's really quite new, and with you know, there's still learning to be done. However, on the back of that, I'd just like to point out some really interesting people and things that we couldn't have done, and things that really are important related to nuclear technology. Of course, you've got people like Albert Einstein, Mary Curie, and Stephen Hawking, who spent their entire careers talking about nuclear science. Um, and it's important to recognize that they are nuclear scientists, they, as well as being scientists. Things like nuclear medicine. So whenever you go uh, for a PET scan or, or, or something similar, you, you, you're engaging with the nuclear fuel cycle. You're engaging with the nuclear industry. Ice, radioisotopes are being put in your body so we can treat and see cancers. Things like CERN, where we're understanding the building blocks of our universe, CERN, the N in CERN stands for nuclear. Um, when we look at the night sky and we see the aurora, that is a nuclear uh, interaction of, of particles with our, with, our, with our atmosphere. And there are things we can be doing and, and building off of what has, been, has gone before me related to climate change, as I'll come on to in a bit, nuclear power is a low carbon source and it is safe. And we could do more with it than just generate electricity. We can generate low carbon or zero carbon or net zero carbon fuels and hydrogen and things like that. So I really want to sort of build a positive story of, of nuclear um, technology um, as well. And I think, you know, when we start, and as I'll come to in a bit, the amount of lives nuclear has saved vastly outweighs the number of, 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 of lives it's sadly taken away in, in severe accidents and acts of um, horror. So this came out this month. This is a United Nations um, uh, a report that puts basically nuclear as one of the best technologies, or if not the best technology, in terms of CO2 emissions. It's worth noting that lots of people don't realize that nuclear does not emit much carbon dioxide at all. In fact, all technologies emit carbon dioxide to some extent, whether you're you know, doing mining and things like that. But because nuclear is such a dense energy source, the, the mining and the transport and the bits and pieces associated with that really are negligible. So nuclear, low carbon energy source, therefore a key tool to, cap, uh, um, to fight climate change along with renewables. And I really do mean along with renewables. Wind and solar and um, hydro have real key play, uh, things to part, play, if not the major portion to play. It's also safe, and it's important to note that it is safe. Um, of course, we hear headlines of Chernobyl and uh, Fukushima, um, but compared to other energy sources per kilowatt, so if you, if you take it per kilowatt produced, nuclear is safer than anything else on the planet. Of course, when it goes wrong, it's quite spectacular. And I always uh, relate this to something like an aeroplane, when you get an aeroplane. We all know flying in an aeroplane is one of the safest ways of getting from A to B. But people are still scared of that rather than getting into their sort of dodgy 1990s car on the motorway hurtling down at 70 miles per hour, two meters away from someone else. So there's 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 there's, there's risk to be and, and and it again, probably poor on the nuclear industry's point of view in communicating this. And the ecological impact is low. And I really mean low. If you look at footprint, nuclear is tiny compared to say. Um, wind and solar. I've got a little picture down there at the bottom left showing sort of various um, areas that it takes up for the same for the equivalent amount of power. And waste, this always comes down to waste. Lots of people mention waste. Waste is actually in modern nuclear a uh, dealt with problem. We know how to handle waste and we know what to do with it. I've got a picture here of um, Trous Finneth, which is in Snowdonia at the old Magnox site, the bottom right. And that is a nuclear waste store. And that is all of the nuclear waste that Trous Finneth produced um, in its, uh, I think it was 40 year lifetime. Um, and you can see that there's lots of room for more, but it's not been used. 
So that's it looks almost it looks a bit James Bondy. It looks a bit bit wiped clean, but it, it it it's it's safe. I stood next to it. I put my hand on one of those things. It's there's nothing wrong with it. I got a little picture at the top right there um, of a person holding a ball, and that's a really interesting one. And I wouldn't do that with real nuclear waste, but that is the amount of nuclear waste a person would produce in their lifetime if everything they did, all the energy they required, was produced from nuclear. It, all the waste would fit in the palm of your hand. If you compare that to the amount of gas you produce when you drive to work and, and submit it out of your exhaust pipe, then it, it, it boggles the mind. Nuclear is a different scale, which is why it's occasionally dangerous and it's why we need to still understand it and regulate it in a very safe and methodological way. So I'll get off my high horse. I'll quickly tell you how nuclear power is made in a power station. Basically, it's the same as uh, how electricity is made in a lot of types of power stations. You've got the reactor vessel on the very left there. It makes water hot. Um, that then circulates into the steam generator. Steam is made. That steam drives turbines, which drives a generator and makes electricity. In modern nuclear, we're considering changing the water in the reactor vessel for, to things like liquid lead or helium gas. Um, but the principles are the same. The principles are the same for gas, for coal, and for other ways of making electricity through heat generation. So that's it. Now, we don't need to just make electricity. We can also do some other things like cogeneration, like make hydrogen and um, even do district heating or industrial heating. So here in North Wales, we've got the Nuclear Futures Institute, as I said, funded by Sir Kimry, and we do a range of things. And there's now eight academics and up to, I think we're up to about 40 PhD students, PDRAs, academics and support staff at the moment. So we have proliferated, pun intended. Uh, my personal background is on fuel manufacturing design, fuel performance, and I do a bit of work on reactor physics as well. We have got focuses on nuclear medicine, so make, making these new medical isotopes to treat cancers and, and illnesses. We've got really strong focus on policy and regulation, making sure the rules are in place to develop this and, 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 and um, industrially use the nuclear safely. And we've got things like monitoring control, and of course, we're looking at waste forms as well. We are engaged quite closely with industry. So these are sort of snapshot of the people that have been funding us over the last four years. Um, obviously, um, it's ranging in amounts, but it's really nice to see that we're, we're really engaging with the, with the community internationally. So this isn't just in, within the UK, uh, it's internationally and in bringing them to Wales to invest in Wales. Here is a little picture of North Wales. You've got Bangor there on the North Wales coastline. And then on the Isle of Anglesey, you've got two sites, Spark and Wilver. Wilver is the nuclear site that we're hoping to put some big new power stations on. I've been told it's the best nuclear site in Europe. Uh, Spark is our little science park where we are hoping to grow our industrial office base and really sort of merge, merge the, or smudge the line between industry and academia, making sure that we can really help industry. And Trous Finneth, that site at the bottom in Snowdonia, it's a beautiful site, is currently the site of decommissioning, but we hope it will be the site of Arthur, uh, a, a test reactor and medical isotope generating reactor, which will generate the UK's nuclear medicine. And if you want something to be angry about, don't be angry at nuclear, be angry at this. We in the UK are shocking, and I mean awful, at nuclear medicines and getting the right medicines to people. Uh, we, uh, we, we trail in Europe to people like Germany, France, uh, Spain, Canada, Australia, um, and it's going to get worse. The supply of nuclear medicines in 20, is going to fall off a shelf in 2026, and we have no decent indigenous supply within the United Kingdom at the moment, uh, and Europe is set to really struggle as well. Brexit probably hasn't helped, and if we don't get our asses in gear, we're going to actually have a real crisis on our hands. People are already dying unnecessarily, and I think more will too. So please get into gear and help us get a nuclear medicine, a, a native nuclear medicine um, supply chain sorted. Um, that's my message for the day. Anyway, in North Wales, we've got um, Merlin facility going. Uh, we've got a lovely facility where we're generating, uh, where we're looking at nuclear materials. We are working with uranium and things like that. We've got my postdoc, Phyllis, who's been producing a new type of nuclear fuel, uh, which eventually will be able to be launched on space, react into space reactors. This is a very robust nuclear fuel. You can't really do any damage. You can hold it in your hand and, 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 and yeah, it's, it's extremely safe. 
Um, she's developed a new way of producing it using spray drying, which is the same way we make dried coffee, which is fun. So well done, Phyllis. We're going through things like patent processes and things like that at the moment. Here's some pictures of it using our microscope. So you can see these little kernels. They look like poppy seeds if you hold them in your hand. We're putting a coating on them that will allow it to operate up to 3000 degrees C. So extremely high temperatures, extremely robust nuclear fuels. We've engaged with the national nuclear user facilities. So these are labs around the country that allow other any, any universities to come and come and come and play with in the nuclear world. Um, we've developing a new lab to manufacture nuclear fuels. Um, and basically, we're going to be developing new ways of processing nuclear fuels, optimizing existing manufacture methods and visualizing in, in the fuels in situ as we make them. We've got this lovely furnace. Well, there's a picture of it here because it's arriving in about two weeks time, uh, but it's a furnace with a window on the side, basically. So we can take go to 2000 Celsius. We can watch nuclear fuel cooking through a window. It's a bit like looking in the microwave, looking at your uh, food cook, but, you know, 2000 Celsius. It's going to be a lot of fun and hopefully we're going to do some fantastic science with it. We're also engaged with the nuclear forensics community, um, including with Atomic Weapons Establishment, AWE, and the National Nuclear Laboratory. Basically, if a nuclear material is found somewhere around the country and they don't know the provenance of it, we can help find out where it's come from. So we're developing new techniques um, and new things like that to understand where it's come from. This is mostly, mostly, most things we find that are radioactive that shouldn't be there uh, derived from hospitals and sort of nuclear waste from hospitals and things like that. Um, these GPs and surgeons, yeah, they're trouble. Um, anyway, so we would welcome you to the Bangor University Fuel Fabrications Facility, or BUFF. Um, we'll really enjoy working with you in the BUFF uh, later this year. Right, um, another thing that we're doing is working on these advanced modular reactors. Um, these I've mentioned before, we can we can cool a reactor not using water, but using other things. And one of the things we're going to cool the reactor with, or we're looking at cooling a reactor with, is liquid lead. Um, so the Bangor University Lead Loop Erosion Testing Facility is being built right now at MSPARC. Um, basically, we're testing materials under some extreme conditions, massive amounts of heat, massive amounts of uh, lead, lead's actually quite benign, it's not very corrosive, but we still need to understand how these materials behave at high temperature. And we're working with the likes of Westinghouse who are developing these lead fast reactors and the NNL, and they're sponsoring us quite a lot. Um, it's part of the Advanced Fuel Cycle Program in the UK, which is sponsored by BASE. So there's a little picture of the sort of thing that we're gonna be building on the right there. That's, the, that's a sister facility to Bullet, which is sitting in Italy at Enea. At the, that's the National Nuclear Lab in Italy. Um, bullet will go up to 650 degrees C. Um, it's also really useful to testing fusion materials. So um, materials that we're gonna be using for fusion reactors. Uh, one of the cooling loops for fusion is lead. Um, so that, that's interesting. I don't know why I included this, but I, 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 I like pictures like this. So this is, this is what Bullet's gonna look like. It's currently being manufactured. It's going to be delivered to MSPAC in January. Um, I think the Italians who are going to come over to see and put this all together are going to find Anglesey in January quite fun. So, yay. Uh, good luck to them. Some other fun stuff we're doing. I'm nearly done. Uh, we're working on nuclear power for space. So if you if you go to if you want to go to the moon, you can't take diesel or petrol with you um, to generate electricity. And um, frankly, the sun up there isn't very uh, strong. So you need to use nuclear power. We've used nuclear power on the Voyager probes to get out of the solar system. We've used uh, nuclear power to, to power the Mars rovers, and we're gonna use nuclear power in the next generation of missions to the moon and beyond. Uh, we're working with the UK Space Agency. We're working with people like Tesla, uh, sorry, um, SpaceX and Rolls-Royce um, to develop these reactors. We're having quite a lot of fun with it because come on, space. Um, there's issues, obviously, that we need to consider, like longevity. These things need to be in space and operating for much longer than without refueling than reactors on Earth. Obviously, we also have to deal with launch, which is somewhat uh, interesting because we need to get it safely up there without it coming down again. Um, but we're doing some quite interesting and novel things. I'll rekindle the anger that I've got on medical isotopes. I worked at Ansto in Australia on medical isotopes. I can see how much of a benefit it is and how lovely it is to engage with nuclear technology through the medical isotope field. Uh, people used to come at, 
residents and people nearby used to come and visit the opal reactor and see what they were doing you get to hang over the uh, over the reactor edge and, and see nuclear medicines being made it's a completely different feeling to nuclear power because it really is and people really do understand the benefits of nuclear medicine and i really cannot say strong enough how much we need something like this in the uk i've also been working with companies like tokamak energy on next generation fusion systems and bizarrely, they are linked. There are there's links between fusion energy and nuclear medicine. There may be really interesting ways of improving nuclear medicine generation with fusion energy. But that is one for the 2030s, 2040s rather than right now. But we're having a lot of fun up here in North Wales, I've got to say. So in summary, we are doing some really wonderful work here. Uh, we've got some really fun capabilities and we've got capabilities in the making. And we really want to engage and collaborate with as many people as possible around Wales and beyond. Um, we've got, you know, uranium active facilities. We're really, you know, at the cutting edge, uh, exactly where industry need us to be. Um, we're engaging with things like space reactors, which I'm really enjoying uh, as well. And um, again, medical isotopes. We really do need to, to light a fire up our asses and sort that out. So thank you very much for listening. Um, happy to entertain any questions now or later. Thank you so much. Well, um, there was your picture of Banga, Banga Tower for us as well. So you, you did show it after all. Exactly. Yeah, um, Simon, that was wonderful. We are going to have to crack on because we've um, overrun by a little bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I really enjoyed your talk. It's one of the most um, most in, you had a most intriguing set of points in um, in praise of your technology that I've ever seen. So really well done. Um, okay, but we're going to move on now to our next speaker um, and take questions for Simon. Um, at the end, if that's all right, do follow Cara's wonderful advice about how to use the protocol for asking questions. I don't think I need to repeat them. Um, if I do, um, put something in the chat and I am trying to, to keep on top of that. Um, but Marina Kovaleva, who's our next speaker, is um, not going to be um, able to present live, but there is a pre-prepared video, I believe. So um, Martin, is it is it possible for us to to now hear that. Yes. I'll, I will I will just say a little bit about her. Um, you've asked us to just introduce the speakers in a slightly more formal way. So let me just say a little bit about Marina, who is a finally a PhD student in the College of Physical Science and Engineering at Cardiff University. And um, she's studying the ammonia combustion, she's part of the ammonia combustion research group. Um, specialising in ammonia combustion chemistry, numerical modelling of ammonia blends and combustion based metal corrosion. And as I say, she's coming towards the, the final stages of her PhD. Hello, my name is Marina and I'm a PhD student at Cardiff University and today I'll be presenting our project on the improvement of of a humidified ammonia hydrogen combustor design. First, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the EPSSC SAFE project, um, as well as my supervisor, Dr. Valera Medina, and the experimental lead for this project, Dr. Mashruk. Just to introduce ammonia as a fuel concept, ammonia has been gaining traction uh, recently as a green hydrogen fuel alternative, with a thought process that renewable energy sources such as solar and wind can be used to manufacture green ammonia and this green ammonia can be stored and transported at long distances and once it is needed uh, again this ammonia some of the some of the ammonia can be converted to hydrogen and then the, these ammonia hydrogen blends can be burnt to produce electricity and the biggest advantage of ammonia is how much cheaper it is to store uh, for long periods of time or tra transport at long distances uh, compared to storing the same amount of hydrogen energy as uh, liquid hydrogen or pressurized gaseous hydrogen. Uh, and so some studies suggest that for a three month period it is 30 times cheaper to store and transport the energy as ammonia. Uh, and though it varies by case by case basis, uh, the benefits are sort of increased as if you're using ammonia as a energy storage vector. Uh, furthermore, um, we already have an established infrastructure for the use of ammonia as it is one of the world's the most widely used uh, chemicals. And uh, 
of course, uh, it is a carbon-free fuel. However, pure 100% ammonia is very difficult to burn on its own, and so often it is doped for, with very small amounts of other fuels, such as, for example, hydrogen, just uh, to improve its combustion properties. And equally, uh, NOx emissions and uh, design of large-scale combustion systems are still a challenge that requires some research and is the main focus of my PhD. And equally, uh, there's still some work to be done on the manufacture of green ammonia to make it cost competitive uh, compared to fossil fuel based uh, manufacture processes. And so uh, this is a uh, value chain of ammonia production map produced by the SIP project from the Japanese government going over the points I just mentioned, so in case the production of green ammonia to then burn this ammonia in gas turbines for electricity or otherwise use it in other methods such as for transportation or as fuel cells. Uh, and recently there's been a lot of work uh, put into ammonia. In particular, we here in the UK are one of the two only countries that have a green ammonia energy demonstrator whereby Green ammonia is manufactured from renewable sources, uh, it is stored, and then it is burnt uh, for electricity in one closed loop. And this in the UK is in the Siemens Oxford Rutherford uh, demonstrator, uh, and there's another one in Japan. But generally, uh, especially in the recent few years, there has been a lot of work going to ammonia energy technologies. Uh, in particular, there have been a lot of green ammonia manufacturing plants, and it's just the case of being able to use those green ammonia manufacturing plants that have been cropping up over the world uh, and connecting them to combustion technologies uh, to produce electricity. Uh, and so for my PhD, uh, I'm covering a broad range of topics, including fundamental flame uh, chemistry analysis, the design of combustors or combustion technologies to burn these ammonia-based blends, uh, numerical methods and simulations, thermoacoustics and materials, and in today's brief presentation um, I will just be going over some of the highlights from these topics. So first looking at the left for the trends of ammonia-hydrogen blends. Uh, on the x-axis we have equivalence ratio which corresponds to the portion of oxygen uh, in the blend and on the y-axis we have the relative uh, uh, volume of species produced or emissions produced from the flame and these are for laminar premixed flames which are representative, relatively representative of what you would see in uh, gas turbine technologies, or at least the trends are transferable to those technologies. And so in general for the ammonia-hydrogen blends, it's possible to see that for very lean or very low equivalence ratios, uh, there are very high uh, nitrous dioxide emissions, and nitrous dioxide is a significant contributor of uh, global warming. It has a very high GWP. So it is more the case that we would be looking to burn at around 1.2 equivalence ratio or very rich low oxygen conditions for these specific blends. Uh, and similarly for the uh, ammonia methane blends, so which are on the right, the ammonia methane blends are interesting as an intermediate towards using ammonia as a fuel. So in this case, if there are some technologies that are already using natural gas or are fossil fuel compatible, then introducing some ammonia um, is a, could be a way of decreasing uh, carbon dioxide and other uh, global warming emissions. And similarly here, we would probably be looking to burn at either very lean or very rich conditions. As you can see, the NO emissions are high at around one equivalence ratio, so we'd be looking to burn in the more extreme, either very high or very low oxygen conditions. Uh, but one key thing is that for the uh, ammonia methane blends, there are high hydrogen cyanide uh, emissions on the rich end that sort of increase in line with unburnt ammonia emissions. So if we are burning 
in the rich end at around 1.2 or 1.3 equivalence ratio, we must be careful not to, uh, to, to at least monitor the unburnt ammonia and hydrogen cyanide emissions as well as to not go too, too much rich and too much in that direction. So now that we uh, have some idea of under what conditions we should be burning our ammonia-based blends, uh, we next looked into uh, designing combustors to burn these blends. And I can't reveal all the details of the design since a lot of them are still uh, confidential. However, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, a um, one of our designs was checked experimentally and through numerical simulation where the top plot is the experimental plot showing the uh, the speed of air going through the um, burner that we designed and underneath is the numerical simulation and they are a very good correlation which means we can use the numerical simulation to represent the experimental results with relative accuracy in this case. Uh, and our general design concept uh, for the burner is around the RQL principle, so it's the rich, quench, lean, burn process, as you can see in figure 11, which is that, first of all, we are burning uh, very lean or at very high oxygen levels, we quench, and then we burn very rich or at very high, um, uh, high fuel, low oxygen levels. And this is a, a sort of a popular method that of decreasing emissions so that any unburnt um, sort of it, any unburnt emissions or usually high NO that comes with burning slightly lean can then finally be burnt off in the rich region. And it's a concept that has taken over for uh, ammonia hydrogen fuels recently. Uh, and finally, we looked at uh, different materials for designing the combustor. So in this case, it was a variety of inconels, mnemonics, and incotherms. Uh, so generally nickel-based super alloys. And we exposed these metal samples to a methane and to an ammonia hydrogen flame for five hours and looked at the difference um, that this made on the materials. So in general we saw that the materials, the metals, were absorbing hydrogen into their structure as you can see in figure 17. However in figure 18 you can see that relatively relative to the uncertainty bar there wasn't a significant change in the mechanical properties that we could spot. So next we'd be looking at exposing the materials to more extreme conditions, potentially pressurized conditions for longer periods of time uh, to see if that um, if that has more of an impact on the mechanical properties. And so just to conclude, ammonia is a promising hydrogen energy carrier for the future with some advantages over hydrogen, especially for long-term storage and transportation. Uh, and so this project is specifically looking at how we can uh, optimize a gas turbine combustor for ammonia-based or ammonia-hydrogen blends by looking at different emissions profiles, designs, and materials. Thank you very much for listening, um, and please feel free to email me any questions. I'd really like to ask a number of questions about um, to what extent members of the public understand the importance of these new ways of these new energy vectors and new ways of storing energy. I think there are a lot of fascinating things for members of the public to really try to understand, uh, as well as the um, obviously well, very well developed technical program which was presented there. Um, I think time, time is short. I can't see any questions in the chat or any hands raised. Um, so I think it's probably best to move on um, have our questions at the end. Um, our next speaker is um, Dr. Rhiannon Chalmers Brown. And um, Rhiannon is going to, uh, to speak about her work in the Sustainable Environment Research Centre, University of South Wales. Uh, she's a postdoctoral researcher interested in sustainable technologies that can help us achieve net zero and create a secure, environmentally friendly world for future generations. She's particularly interested in the efficient separation and extraction of products from bioreactors using membrane technologies. So let's, um, hopefully you can share your screen, Rhiannon. Yep, I'll have a go now. Um, uh, 
How's that? Great, thank you. You got that? Yep. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, thanks for the introduction, Karen. Um, so I am Rhiannon. Um, as Karen said, I work at University of South Wales. Um, I'm a postdoc researcher in C1 biochemistry. Um, and I'm going to be chatting about my work that, um, so it's, it's research that feeds into what's referred to as the VFA factory. So I'll explain more about that in a little bit. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, my background is in chemistry um, and catalysis. So I did a master's at Cardiff University and then I worked for a time in the hazardous waste disposal industry. Um, and then I returned to USW to do my PhD then. Um, so I'm continuing that work that I started in my PhD um, as a postdoc um, and working on some other projects at the same time as well. Um, so I'm primarily a climate scientist. So I'm trying to find answers to the climate crisis really. Um, so what is climate? Well, in a short answer, it's the long-term pattern of weather typically averaged over a period of about 30 years. So since I've lived in Wales, I've definitely noticed a significant shift in weather patterns. So far more um, extreme storms, heavy rainfall, um, colder winters, hotter summers. I'm sure you've all noticed the same, same kinds of patterns. Um, so they're just some of the sort of effects that, that climate change can have. Um, I volunteer for Central Beacons Mountain Rescue Team, and I'm currently training in swift water response to perform rescues during floods and natural disasters. Um, so that's something I, I have an interest in outside of work as well, um, but it does kind of relate back to my, my sort of work. Um, so Alongside my research, I'm also involved with the South Wales Industrial Cluster um, as a member of the Future Leaders Group. Um, so we advise on the deployment project um, and we sort of um, liaise with the senior members of the deployment project on um, certain tasks. Um, and um, yeah, so that, that's just a bit of background about me, really. Um, what am I actually doing? Uh, so my work's part of a larger platform of funding called the VFA Factory, as I mentioned. Um, and the aim is to bring together projects that can work towards the decarbonisation of heavy industry in South Wales and possibly globally as well, um, through the production of volatile fatty acids. So um, a volatile fatty acid is a, um, a fatty acid that's volatile, really. Um, <laughs> So you can see in the corner there, that's acetic acid, and that's the um, sort of main VFA that we are working towards producing. Um, so um, we're working towards the production of VFAs from carbon containing industrial off gases. Um, so for example, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, um, that are produced as byproducts of uh, industrial manufacturing processes, things like that. Um, and then we want to use those VFAs to produce biopolymers, bioplastics, steel coating materials, um, cement additives, lipids, amino acids. Um, there's a, a huge long list of things that we can manufacture. Um, so my current project work is building pilot scale bioreactors to convert steel manufacturing off gases to acetic acid. So I'm going to go into a, a bit more detail about a project called COACE, um, and that's in collaboration with Tata Steel down at Port Talbot. So why do we want to decarbonise industry? Um, surely, you know, in terms of the environment, it would be a better idea just to get rid of it altogether. Well, probably, yeah, but um, we all want to continue to live and to prosper um, in comfort, in good health. Um, and partly that means we need industries. Um, so in particular, the steel accounts for 15% of Wales's total carbon dioxide emissions. However, um, steel is fully recyclable. It's used in the construction and delivery of renewable energy systems. 
So approximately 230 tonnes of steel are required for one wind turbine. Um, and it's about 50 turbines for a, a farm. Um, so that's, that's a lot of steel. Um, steel manufacturing provides local jobs and contribu contributes about two billion pound, uh, pounds per annum in terms of gross value added to the UK economy. Um, so new carbon dioxide uh, technologies will provide and protect jobs in the steel industry and as well protect, um, protect Welsh industrial heritage. Um, so I've, I've put this picture in here. This is me sort of doing some training um, in flood response. It's quite a funny picture, um, but it's kind of here to demonstrate that whilst I'm training in that flood and disaster response, it's only going to become more necessary and more needed if we can't decarbonize industry and solve the climate crisis. Um, so, you know, I think, um, as Catherine said earlier, you know, fun now and theory follows. It's kind of a, a similar sort of thing, really. Um, I'm having fun with my training, but, you know, in the future, I'm going to have to put that into practice, I think, which um, hopefully if I can solve these problems, I may, maybe won't have to. Um, so, um, COAS is taking carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide directly from blast furnace gas. So naturally occurring bacteria collected from municipal wastewater treatment plants use the carbon as an energy source and they convert the carbon into um, our VFAs. So they, they use it as food and their waste is VFAs. Um, as long as we provide the bacteria um, their preferential conditions, then they'll continue to grow and produce VFAs for us. So we just need to extract those and then we can use them as building block chemicals um, so the impact here is twofold um, in that it reduces CO2 emissions um, and CO emissions from the steel industry. And it also reduces the demand on those raw materials um, that contain carbon that are non-renewable that we need to produce um, bioplastics um, materials, et cetera. Um, so during my PhD, we started with small scale batch studies um, and we got some really positive results. So those experiments revealed 92% of the total CO2 that we put into that headspace um, was used by the bacteria and converted to VFAs. Um, so it's, it's quite a high conversion efficiency. Um, so we then went on to scale up the process and put a reactor on site, which you can see in, in the picture. Well, you can't see it in the picture because I'm stood in front of it, but it's behind me in the picture. Um, so that reactor is currently running at the moment on site at Port Talbot. Um, and we're hoping to get data from that. Um, well, we're collecting data. We're hoping to analyze that um, as soon as possible, really. Um, so we're also looking at building a second pilot reactor um, and that's under development. So that's going to convert renewable hydrogen and CO2 streams to volatile fatty acids. Um, and that's going to be situated at the hydrogen center on the Baglan Energy Park. So what's next? Um, future work will include the development of the H2S reactor um, and the continue op continuous operation of both COACE and H2S pilot reactors. Um, I'd quite like to look at process intensification. So um, looking into the microbiology and how to increase that bacterial concentration so that we can increase the VFA yield. Um, we've got a novel extraction process as well that we want to add to both of those reactors and test um, so that we can continuously extract product whilst we're producing it. Um, and um, yeah, I'd just like to look at microbiology really to see how the bacterial populations um, change throughout the operational life of the, the bioreactors. Um, so this could lead on to the deployment of bioreactors at demonstration and full scale, and then the application to other carbon intensive industries. Um, so anything that produces CO2, we can apply this, this technology to really. Um, so I'd just like to finish by saying thank you to our funders, um, our industrial partners and sponsors, and thank you to everyone listening.
Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Rhiannon. Um, it's been wonderful to see three talks which are showing how in Wales there is so much being done, so much effort being put in and so much expertise and industry being shown in ensuring that our industries and our technologies are contributing to the low carbon um, transition. Um, now, in terms of questions, I do have one um, in the chat. Um, it's from Martin, which I can turn to. Um, but just before that, um, I can't see any other hands being raised. I did want to just ask all of the speakers about time and the question of time. Um, people who work on, on technology innovations are um, very adept at um, thinking about time, short term, medium term and long term um, impacts of the kind of work that they have. And I'm wondering whether we could start with Simon and just say you know, th this question of time, the, we're all talking about net zero 2050 now, and that's the, the sort of a longer term target, although it's not that far away. For, for nuclear, um, you know, do you think that the contribution of nuclear is going to be timely enough? Oh, certainly. Um, so I'll do energy and things like that first, and I'll explain what I think is the timeline between now and 2050. So at right now, we're going to be building what I consider big, boring reactors, um, Hinkley C, size will C, potentially will the B or will the new earth. Um, and they're going to, you know, they're going to take us back to where we were at the end of the last decade. So 20 percent nuclear um, and ensure that we've got that base load capacity, that that stuff that doesn't turn off uh, that often. And it's 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 there whenever you need it. And that will complement the renewables really well. Now, beyond 2030, we, we've got things like the small modular reactor program coming on from Rolls-Royce, and that will help not only generate electricity, and I think there's, there's some benefits there, so we could go up to maybe 25%, but I think what it does is it generates the opportunity to make low carbon fuels, a uh, bit like what we heard in that last talk, uh, and that deep decarbonisation, the difficult to decarbonise things like steel, like we can be producing steel with hydrogen made from reactors and renewables and things like that instead. So all of these things starting in 2030 really do sort of snowball, I think, and it will allow us to achieve that 2050 goal. So I wouldn't, I, I, I think, you know, where we are now, it may seem a bit bleak and it's a bit of a, and it is a challenge and we need to, we need to sort of pinpoint it with this laser focus. We need to carry on. It's not something that we can take our foot off the gas for, or, you know, a battery or whatever. So we need to go. Um, on medicine, it's shorter term. Uh, people are going to start really struggling at the end of the decade if we don't get our act together. Um, and we're, you know, we're an aging population. We're going to need more uh, medical interventions like PET scans and things like that. Um, and, you know, our populations are going to demand it too. Um, so I would say that that's actually a crisis at the moment um, or a crisis in the making. And we need to sort that out. So okay. thank you, Simon. Positivity. Yes, yeah, thank you for such a full answer. Rhiannon, are, are you able to say anything about um, carbon capture and utilisation and the time horizons that you're working to with that technology? Yeah, I mean, if I could put it on the steelworks tomorrow, then I would. Um, <laughs> I think, yeah, it, it needs doing now, but realistically, it's it's going to take time to get those technologies to the stage that they can be applied and and realistically deployed um yeah we we don't really have time <laughs> yeah okay thanks very much um it, it is sometimes a little bit um disturbing isn't it when you when you do start thinking about lack of time um, I suppose one of my experiences of working as part of engineering consortia, it does sort of give you confidence that, um, you know, there's a lot of effort and um, the prospects of, of change not happening. I, I think, uh, look, I, I'm not too, too despondent about it. Um, but let's just move on to um, the question that was posted in the chat by, by Martin. Um, Martin is saying that We've heard quite a lot about, particularly from the, the talk on um, nuclear, nuclear systems, about environmental benefits. Um, what about social acceptability challenges? And are scientists involved enough in those questions? 
Um, so maybe we should we start with you, Rhiannon, and then um, go to Simon afterwards. Uh, yeah, sorry, what, what was the question for me? Yeah, um, we, we've heard a little bit from Simon about the environmental benefits of decarbonising um, our energy systems um, and our society. But what about the challenges that these technologies pose um, to the public, the, the sense that this is acceptable to the public, these technologies? Do you think carbon yeah. capture and storage is publicly acceptable? And do scientists do enough to, to um, engage with the public? that's something we're actually working on quite a bit at the moment and the short answer is I don't know um it's it's quite difficult because you've got such a range of people that have such a range of different knowledge different opinions um and it's the same within academia you know my um colleagues could think that oh one thing is the way to do something and I might disagree and there's no saying that one of us is right and one of us is wrong. It's it's quite tricky because I always use the example of, you know, when we decided to go with combustion instead of um, electric cars, you know, we were like, well, it's more efficient, but we didn't foresee the issues that that would cause in the future. And it's quite tricky at the moment to be in that position to say, okay, we're going to go with these technologies and then, you know, we're going to produce VFAs and that's going to solve loads of issues. But, you know, I'm, I might be completely missing the point with something and not foreseeing an issue that could happen in the future. Um, and we as scientists have to be quite careful that we do try and look at the bigger picture. Um, in terms of the general public, I think it's all about education and involving them and a lot of people in my work they care about the steelworks because in Port Talbot that's most of the people that live there either work or have some sort of connection to the steelworks um so they're definitely interested but it, for them it's very much business as usual unless their jobs are threatened so I think all of this needs to be put in terms that the general public can understand and relate to um you know, if I go on about microbiology, most of the general public probably aren't going to care. But if I say my technology is going to save your job, they'll be like, cracking, perfect. <laughs> um, does that answer a little bit? Excellent. Yeah, well, it was extremely full and interesting answer. And uh, it looks as if you've been thinking an awful lot about um, engaging members of the public in the um, sorts of technological transitions that you're involved in. What about Simon? Are you able to answer that question? Yeah, um, Martin, the answer in the nuclear industry is we've been historically crap. Um, we've been, you know, we, we sit, we, it's often a lot people that look a lot like me, often wearing suits or, 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 or and things like that, and trying to push a nuclear agenda, as it were. Um, and um, however, you know, places like North Wales are very nuclear, except we've got two nuclear sites and similar to Port Talbot with the steelworks, there is a lot of local support. However, um, they're shut down. Uh, there's a little bit of a social license, as, I, as we call it, and it's and it's and it's diminishing uh, day by day. I think um, as 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 jobs go, um, as, and 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 you know, we we've had a couple of big engineering um, failures. I think recently, where people were saying they were going to build reactors and they pulled out last minute, and 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 the local the local populace is is is, 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 is losing its patience. I suppose there is that. Um, and, and winning hearts and minds, understand, getting people to be ed educated on, 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 on the subject and things like that is really important. And again, this is where I think nuclear medicine comes in, uh, having these sort of small reactors that allow and, and really engaging with the people, bringing the public to the coalface, as it were, showing them what we're doing and how it not only generates electricity, but save lives, decarbonizes, potentially produces hydrogen for, for, for industry and things like that. I think there's a lot that we can do. Um, and of course, you know, I spoke a little bit about space and, you know, if there's something that, 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 that a lot of people can fall behind, and I know a lot of people uh, roll their eyes at it, uh, but the, 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 the space missions and things like that we're seeing from SpaceX and so on um, to go, you know, nudge an asteroid that was this week. I mean, they're, they're, they're fascinating. And um, I think the public can, fall, can really get behind them. And if we, if we can educate, along with them having fun and, and seeing some real benefits to their lives as as we said earlier but Rihanna, jobs 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 
um, then um, I think I think we can do better. And I think it's all on the horizon. I think we just need to make sure we don't abuse that social license that we've got right now. Thank you so much. Um, well, this has been a fantastic session. It's wonderful to hear um, those uh, professionals, scientists who are working on technological questions in such a lively way, making technology such a lively actor, to use a phrase from science and technology studies. But from my point of view as a social scientist, to hear how it's possible to deal effectively and humanely with the climate emergency and its impacts as part of those technological projects. So um, it's made me have a very warm sense of um, hearing research, what I think is really going to matter in all those sorts of ways.